Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill. We have a, uh, a unique and a hopefully ongoing uh, type of episode we're gonna share with you today. Um, it's uh, this. It's actually going to be in a series, and we're going to call it uh, Episode Zero. The idea being that we, amongst the three of us, and with the other anti-war veterans that come on the podcast, that we try to dissect a little more of the early personal experiences they have, of um, a little more about what their time in, in the military was actually like, and most especially discussing the beginnings of their personal choice to dissent and how that has expanded. Um, it, it's a, a secondary thing, which I think is, is very important, but it's not the, the main reason for doing it, but that the, I want all of you to be able to understand more about the personal and moral toll that military life that a military career can often bring so without any further ado danny are you ready for some questions absolutely love them fire away so let's start with your time as a kid you tell us a little bit about how you grew up and your relationship with the military, whether in ideas and movies or in, in actuality with your family, how you came into all of that? Uh, I had, I had always been like a bookish kid and also very fascinated by like extreme human behavior. So I, I early on anything about war, like books about war, especially like very uh, intense, like martyrdom, last stands, you know, um, and, and also like just sort of like profound leaders that like changed the world. You know, I remember I like three distinct phases when I was a kid, because I would just go empty the library out of like every book on certain topics and like, and just, just, that's all I did. I was just like read, you know, in private. And you know, it was like, one summer, it was like the Alamo, you know, I needed another, I watched every movie about it and film was important to me, still is. And, and I read every book in the library about it. And then, yeah, then it was like Custer's Last Stand was another summer or, or break or whatever. And then, you know, Napoleon. And I, I think I was just attached to the epic and I was also attached to like the martyrdom. And I mean, I think that part of that is uh, a reflection of like the vague, like Irish martyrdom, death cult Catholicism that like worships the dead that I kind of came up in. And so I loved to read about that stuff and I really liked film and, you know, we're around the same age, all of us and like sort of the same culture, cultural touchstones that I like constantly reference and make like offhand jokes about my articles that are like go over most people's heads. You guys read them. And I think a lot of people our age do, especially people who went into the military and they, and they maybe uh, they see the same things. And so for me, I came up on, all movies, but the two main genres that I was just like obsessed with were war films that largely came out of the eighties, you know, which I think is an important era in filmmaking. And I'll get to that in a second. And then world war two and Western movies from like the forties, fifties, sixties. And, and those are, there's some great films, by the way, that come out of that era uh, as well as a lot of really shitty ones. But what they had in common, I think, was like a nostalgia and a uh, canonization and a sanitization of, of warfare. And this idea that there is no higher form of human behavior in terms of courage, adventure, 
and just being interesting, which I very self-consciously wanted to be, you know, looking back now with like some more adult self-awareness, like I don't really like a lot of things about childhood, teenage, and even early twenties, Danny, you know, like I, I, I was very hyper aware of this idea that I wanted to be something special. Right. And maybe probably some of that was driven in like by an insecurity or something. And those movies really romanticized um, the military, the proud, quiet, tough professional and like the leadership and all that stuff. And, um, you know, so if you look at the World War Two and the, and the Western movies, I mean, what they did was they, they really heroicized, of course, the Second World War, um, of course, like the cowboy frontier culture of like rugged individualism and, and all, but also teamwork and, you know, being the cavalry and stuff. I mean, and then those 80s movies are interesting. And, and if you allow the diversion, I, I'm a film buff a little bit. I know just enough to be dangerous. I read just enough to be dangerous. But the, if the 70s are the golden age of American film, and I think they may well be, uh, specifically of like the dark anti-hero American film. Okay. Uh, what are the two things that stand out about 1970s movies? Well, the two genres that really jump out and come into their own are dark war movies. Tear Hunter, Apocalypse Now is like right at the tail end of the 70s, right? Um, that really turn war, especially the Vietnam War, into this like surreal, almost nearly psychedelic and cerebral dark experience. And then the the crime movies, right? So uh, Godfather, Mean Streets and all that stuff, right? Taxi Driver, anti-heroes are very popular. And I liked those movies, but I didn't appreciate them as much at the time. What I really liked was 80s um, hyper patriotic and sanitized versions of war. You know, Reagan both reflex and affects the culture of the 80s. And so you've got Rambo and Top Gun and they're over the top and they bear no resemblance to the reality of war, but they feel really good. And they give this idea that uh, at Hunt for Red October and Tom Clancy novels are very similar, right? Uh, mm -hmm. This idea that the lone white American male, right? And it, it doesn't have to be racial, but I think that there's something to this, can be a hero, right? Can be special, can like have profound importance and all this. Uh, and, and how do you do that? Well, doing it through like war and the military is like one of the great identities. And so that whole cultural component combined with a sense that I wanted to do things that I did not do growing up, you know, because we were from a fairly modest family. We weren't like indigent or anything, but we didn't travel, you know. I mean, I jumped out of like the third plane I was ever on, you know, at an airborne school. Um, that's true. And I wanted to like just, you know, get out of the neighborhood, get out of Staten Island, do something interesting, ex experience the world. So when you combine the uh, desire for adventure, excitement, and travel with this idea of how can I do that and be important, right? Like be, uh, be someone people would look up to that can like make profound changes in the world. The military seemed like a really great com way to do that. And so I don't think that I'm alone and, and I would be interested to know what you guys, what your experience was with like uh, art, culture, uh, for art forms and stuff surrounding military service. But, you know, I was the perfect candidate for the be all you can be corporate contracted advertisement agency built uh, army recruiting commercials. I mean, I was their candidate where it was like, okay, well, what are we, who are we trying to get? We're trying to get kids that like aren't super rich because they're not joining, uh, but are, are, are sort of vaguely uh, pageantry patriotic, as I call it in the last book, and want to be special and can be sort of like, we can play on that stuff, right? Like we can hit those those kind of funny bones and um and that's kind of that was my journey but what what how, how did i mean if you don't mind me asking how did you guys kind of experience the 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 film book you know world as it regarded that i mean did, you, did anything that i'm saying kind of like resonate from that era oh yeah i mean i think it's a little different because like i was 14 when 9 11 happened so like that just completely profoundly changed my entire perception of America because I, I wanted to like start understanding what the hell was going on in the world. So I started finding outside news sources from like across the world and like trying to figure out what the hell was going on. But like definitely that like pre 9-11, like that whole era of movies and 
the uh yeah i mean navy seals and top gun and those others that you mentioned it's just like those all stuck out to me definitely in that same way of like oh this is something to feel like if you make this decision it's gonna be better for you and like i think that that's the general theme that they were coming across with a lot of like giving like service to your country in this way is like the best you know version of a man you can be or whatever which i think is ridiculous but like that 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 was the attractive thing to a lot of people but i think what changed um it was interesting because you 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 were mentioning in the 80s that like market rise and like the the things that we can make dudes feel like and i feel like post 9 11 they were absolutely doing that again And like we saw a lot of the resurgence of the like America good, other people bad trope. So like, like all these big World War II epics, you know, that were like clearly pitting who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And so like that really does shape people's perspective a lot of what's going on. So yeah, I totally agree with you. I saw the first uh, Michael Keaton Batman when I was five years old. And I still remember staring at the huge cutouts of Batman as we walked into the movie theater. And I was, you know, in terms of a connection, I was done. It was, you know, superheroes um, was was just something that just got glued into me. But I also, uh, my old man's favorite film is Die Hard. And I absolutely <laughs> grew up on those, on the, on the lethal weapons. And I was, I, I was very, paid attention to people's backgrounds like Al Pacino and Heat that the when they were doing some investigation doing counter intel on the on the cops coming after them and they mentioned about that he was in the Marine Corps and he had a master's degree and it you know showed this very diverse very hard working person but a but a very specific path and that specific path is in so many other places um but no, I, I loved all those 90s movies, you know, The Rock, Con Air, um, <laughs> and, and like uh, Con Air is another good example is that the, you know, the movie has nothing at all to do with the military. But in the very beginning, you're, you are exposed to a little 30, 35 second montage of a uh, film from the Gulf War. And it's talking about the Rangers and how awesome they are and how they go in behind enemy lines and how they have scuba teams and they have this and they have that. And it really sells that. And and then you start thinking that all of these factors, all of these hero things, well, the military has to play a role in there. I thought a very big role. And, and it really doesn't, you know, that her- heroism is something that can only exist in a certain time and place because that 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 action that thing is needed you don't you can't just create it um and then came uh the war movies um saving private ryan uh affected me very deeply um aside from understanding how brutal combat was it was a way for me to connect to my grandfathers that it served you know is that as trying to interpret this as like, okay, wow, this is approximating something they went through. Oh my fucking God. Um, and my, my one grandfather, we watched quite a few of those and I think he was wanting to, he had been in the army in the fifties, but he didn't serve in a conflict. And I think he really wanted to layer into me the reality. This is the reality. If you choose the reality, okay, but this is the reality. Um, but I, yeah, I want I wanted desperately to be part of that group of heroes, to be someone on the level of John McClane in terms of toughness and ingenuity and all these other things that it, it, it just made absolutely no sense. And so when, you know, Danny, like you mentioned, be all you can be hit me very hard, as well as an army of one. They went from that to, you know, this whole army of one. Um thing and it it you know in the back of my mind it's like okay well that must mean that they care more about their soldiers you know if they're willing to say that i my being a one soldier i'm a fucking army of one and then 9 11 happened and i was done 
it's like okay i'm you know there's i, I was already going to join i was at meps on september 13th 2001 with the giant televisions watching the the fallout of 9-11 and it just seared into my psyche that i was going to be a part of this i wasn't sure where or what uh not having normal color vision made it so i couldn't become a ranger uh so i ended up becoming an mp and i'm i'm very thankful that i became an mp over <laughs> many other mos's um yeah um Danny, if you were to pick a favorite fictional character or hero, movie hero, whomever, who, who, who might you pick? What would you think? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say two, um, a war one and, and a non-war one. So non-war, one of my favorite genres always has been uh, prison and sort of crime anti-hero movies, you know? Um, I, I think for probably obvious reasons, but uh, Cool Hand Luke. You know, um, that character, you know, Lucas Jackson, you know, has always kind of stood out with me, this idea of, you know, people who transcend like the evil around them and are able to like be beautiful, right? In the worst of circumstances. I mean, anyone who's seen Cool Hand Luke and then also seen Shawshank Redemption probably recognizes that they're like, there is no doubt that, right, the writer, screenplay director was influenced in the Andy Dufresne character by sort of the, the Cool Hand Luke character a little bit. So, and I had seen that in war a bit that there were just people I served with who were just kind and, and free and independent and transcended everything. It's like, you know, it's like they weren't even there. It's like, they were just like floating through. But of course I've always, always been attracted to tragic heroes, um, martyrdom, that sort of stuff has always stood out to me and is very deep in Western culture. Right. Um, whether it be paintings or film or books or whatever. I mean, it, Western art is obsessed. And I used to show this in my paintings that I would use for history class, you know, when I was teaching at West Point, are obsessed with martyrdom, right? Are obsessed with like mm -hmm. the, 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 the Christ analogy, the lamentation scene of the dying Christ, right? Which is like recreated in everything from like the painting of like the Battle of Quebec, you know, like with uh, General Wolf, you know, in the arms of his troops. And so, Cool Hand Luke, of course, dies uh, with his like arms spread like a cross. And then that's how the movie ends is like pulling his picture up to like the crossroads where they're working on the chain gang and they show him like crucified on the cross. So he stood out to me. I mean, I'm not dogmatically religious, but I'm very like uh, attached to the old Catholic sort of uh, imagery. And then Elias from Platoon, uh, which was the exception to the 80s canonization, sanitization of war uh, mm -hmm. in classic Oliver Stone fashion uh and not wanting to go with the crowd uh for the better usually um the elias character was the war version of that in many ways you know um a, a kind and gentle soul who was also competent at his military job but was willing to admit that the war was wrong we were losing and to protect civilian life to his own detriment um and then he dies of course in one of the most famous martyrdom christ-like poses in film history uh, when he's left behind and you know throws his arms in the air and, and, and all this. And, and I, I can't watch that scene to this day without literally crying. Um, and I think I just maybe saw some people like that in the military. And I probably always styled myself wanting to be that way, although I never had the courage or competence to be. But those characters have always uh, stood out to me. Yeah, probably the most, the, the most influential that I keep going back to, you know. So why don't um, take us up to joining, getting to West Point? How did that How did that process happen, and um, what was it like being there in the short time before nine eleven happened? You know that is, I've like tried to explain that in like books, interviews, articles, but I think that it is very difficult to communicate to someone who's younger than us by a lot, right? Um, or even some people our age, it is difficult to communicate how different the army was in July of 01 when I joined and how different it was on September and September 12th, right? Mm -hmm. Just like a couple months later. Um, I didn't see a whole lot of the army army. Obviously I, I spent that entire time in cadet basic training, just doing the same things you do in regular army basic training, but up there, 10th mountain division comes down and trains us and stuff. Um, and then I was like starting school, you know, as like a plebe, just like getting hazed, hating life, you know? Um, 
pinging around the campus at a double time march, you know. But what was different about it is we were an army in search of an enemy. And our analogies and our cadences and our assumptions were still very much stuck in the Cold War. And so, and this lingered past 9-11. I mean, we all shot crazy Ivans on the range, right? That's like what we nicknamed the targets, which literally back then and, and for some time after had like red stars on their like beret on their like green silhouette target. Um, and, and so there was that. So there was this like lost in a war that never needed to be fought, couldn't have been won. And now, although get ready, Cold War II, right? But, but wasn't, it, it was not a thing anymore. We were trapped in that. And, uh, and, and there was no sense joining then, naively maybe, but there was no sense that you were joining the army and going to West Point because you were going to go to war. Like, I mean, I guess I kind of hoped for one sort of, but it, because I wanted <laughs> to be a man, but, the, but, but even what I, I, it was beyond my imagination that we would be in a 20 year war or an extended one or a really bloody one because since Vietnam, you know, Black Hawk Down was, and we've talked about family, we've talked about Black Hawk Down on the show a number of times, but that was the worst combat day imaginable. It was the reference point for what combat could be. And it was a, a single day, really, you know, I mean, um, it was October 3rd of 93, right? Like I was 10 years old. I mean, so my, my idea in terms of going in the army is that what it meant was training, a lot of Top Gun-like scenes in bars, serenading girls in uniform. And if you're lucky, uh, a 100-hour war like the Gulf War, where you don't really think you're going to die, but you get to, like, come back to big parades and, like, maybe you, but you'll, you'll almost definitely get to go to the Balkans, which I'm pleased at a lot, right? Uh, get to go to the Balkans <laughs> and, like, screw around in Kosovo and, like, Macedonia or something and, like, take cool pictures and act like you're a soldier. That was the that was my, my my expectation, right? And and in some ways it was naive, but in other ways it was grounded in what the American military experience had been since Vietnam. So for the most part, um, Grenada, right? This like theater war, which happened the year I was born, um, stayed in our collective consciousness more than Lebanon, which happened days before the Grenada invasion, and was a real mess, and and was actually the thing we should have been keeping an eye on because the unclear muddled mission getting involved in a Middle East civil war and then like paying the consequences and blowback uh, was actually a more relevant analogy than like the theater invasion of a non-threat like Granada, which was done in large part to erase the media attention and public attention and opinion poll attention on what had been a disastrous Reagan intervention in Lebanon just days before with the Marine Corps bombing that killed 241 Marines. So um, I guess my point is I, I, there was no expectation that there would be like a real war until my senior year. At, and that held on for a while because because until my senior year at West Point, almost none of our instructors had combat patches, which, of course, for those who don't know, is this like patch you wear on your right shoulder uh, of the unit you went to a combat deployment with. And it denotes that you have, in fact, been to combat. And, and especially in those early years that I was in the Army, whether one had a combat patch or not determined his self-worth largely and his collective worth among his peers. Like, if you didn't have a combat patch, it was like no one took you seriously, especially as like an officer. You know, you're a second lieutenant. Until you have that combat patch, you're not really in the Army. No one has to take you seriously, sort of, because you haven't been there and seen the elephant. Well, Guys didn't start coming back from the post 9-11 wars after they filtered through grad school in order to come back and teach at West Point until really my junior and senior year. So even though the war was happening and they were announcing the names of dead graduates with some regularity at morning breakfast, just moments of silence, oh. uh, the reality of war hadn't come home even in the experience of our instructors. For the most part, the only guys who had combat patches were a small number that had been in like the Gulf War or maybe been with like Tent Mountain or the Rangers in Somalia. And then a, a handful of Vietnam vets who were full bird colonels in charge of like academic departments because they can stay on like longer than normal retirement um, because they're like academy professors is their functional area within the army. Um, what was interesting though, is that those Vietnam era colonels were way more circumspect and critical of the early post 9-11 wars and were way more apt to tell us to be careful what we wish for, right, in terms of seeing combat, than the captains and majors who had 
done like the Gulf War or maybe had done Somalia or something uh, in a tangential way because, you know, very few of them had like been with the Rangers in the actual fight or Delta or anything. So, and I think that reflects what we're talking about here, which is like the expectations of what war is because those Vietnam guys, they, they'd seen this movie before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right of like a prolonged intervention without a real aim or, or or tangible mission and end state they knew that and they were skeptical of it and that was interesting by the way and i don't think i paid enough attention to it at the time mm-hmm. um when the, the the officers started coming back who had done the initial invasion of iraq or maybe had done uh the early uh iraq uh, afghanistan thing if they were like infantry light infantry or rangers um they were like maybe a little more circumspect, but even then in 2004 and five, when I was a junior and senior, there was still a bit of triumphalism about the war, even among those who'd been in it. Um, when it started to change was around that same time, actually like late 04, early 05, before I graduated, because by the time I graduate, Iraq has turned irreparably bad, you know, this is the time of Fallujah 1, Fallujah 2. This is the time of Sadr's uprising in Karbala, Najaf, and Sadr City. This is the time of the early rumblings that an actual outright sectarian civil war that we caused is about to, to unfold. And so there were just a lot of different influences, but the bottom line of how it like went down in terms of like getting to West Point, though, because I think I kind of went off a little bit topic, is that I was I knew I wanted to be in the army. I had the grades and the SATs for pretty good college if I wanted it, but um, I actually had even thought about enlisting because I wanted some sort of like authentic experience. I've always been on this like journey of like I have to find some sort of radical authenticity. Unfortunately, back then I was seeking an authenticity that didn't exist. But um, I wasn't too bullish on ROTC, although I did apply to some schools. Um, because I thought that that's like weekend warrior stuff, you know, that's not real. That's not man. I'm, I'm only a goddamn man, you know? And like, I use that word very purposefully, right? Cause there is a gendered element to this, but, um, my dad had said, well, what about West point? Because if you go to West point, you're like technically on active duty, although not really, but like technically you are, you know, and you do like you're a soldier all the time and it's like hard and you really are like kind of in, in the army or at least learning to be. And so why don't, you know, why don't you apply? And I was like, ah, you gotta be like a rich kid or at least like maybe know a congressman or be some sort of blue blood to go there. And he was like, no, 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 no. I did my research like pre internet, you know, or we didn't, at least we didn't have um, all that at the time, uh, at least not really. And so he had like done his research. I was like, no, no, it's pretty egalitarian now. Like it's possible you can get in and blah, blah, blah. So, um, so I applied uh, basically with the promise of like, okay, but if you get in, you really got kind of got to go, you know what I mean? Like, but, but I think I partly didn't think I would. And, uh, and then I got in and, and, and then when I did, it was such a big deal in the family. I mean, I, I joke about it on shows and stuff all the time, but like, who doesn't love gold stars? I mean, like delusion and the need for positive reinforcement I'm a white American male. That shit is my birthright. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like when I was the golden child hero of like my family and like my entire social system, because like, oh my God, like then he's going to go to college and he's going to go to West Point. Like, yeah, I mean, I was really excited about it. And I thought I was like the coolest and that, wow, nothing will ever be as big as this. Like I remember thinking (laughs) in terms of like accomplishments or something. It's so silly when I say it out loud, but it felt like a really big deal. And, um, and so that's kind of how I ended up there. And then I kind of, like I had talked about, about how different the army was uh, in that early part. But when the towers came down, and this was my last point that I've also mentioned a number of times in some other shows, but when the towers came down, I did know that like life had changed. I did know that, but I didn't know that it had changed quite as irreparably because I knew we would go to war and I knew this was going to be a big deal, but I think I was really worried that I would miss the war because I was still operating on that old notion of what military service is and means. And so what I was thinking was this will also probably maybe it'll be a little longer than the Gulf War because it's like a little harder to find terrorists. But this thing's probably still going to wrap up maybe before I graduate. And then my lot in life, talk about a tragedy, my lot in life will be to walk around the army for five years on active duty after I graduate with no combat pouch. (gasps) How will I value myself? How will I look in the mirror? Will I be able to sleep at night? I mean, dude, I wish this wasn't true, but that is what I thought. Um, And it wasn't until, again, 04, 05, junior and senior year, when I started to get a little scared, I think. I started to understand, like, maybe I got in here, like, a little over my head. Like, maybe... 
this is going to be real because for the first time, guys that had been upper class when I was there died, right? Um, I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, that's real. And also it was just – the class of 04 graduated, and by the time I graduated, they were almost all either in or on their way into Iraq. And so when I so by the time I graduate, all those delusions were gone, those fantasies of like the war being short. And the question wasn't, am I going to war? The question was, uh, which unit am I going to and where are they on the patch chart that literally <laughs> shows you how units rotate in and out? People were choosing – duty stations because you get to choose based on your class rank so if you're fairly high you can like pick something and like you want like a cool spot like Hawaii or something and i got four cars which was like pretty high and i was excited about that but you people were picking units picking posts because they were following the patch chart and they knew like okay it's going to take me this long to go through obc officer basic uh course right and then rotate to my unit and guys were trying to pick units that would be rotating into iraq or would already be there so they would go meet them like as soon as they graduated and that's how like because guys felt like they had to get in the fight because now we've spent four years training for a war that has been ongoing for almost all four of those years and everyone wants in um it just so it just gives you an idea of how much things had changed uh but the the army in the brief bit that i saw it before 9 11 it, it was almost, it's almost it it was almost unrecognizable to me by the time i entered like the a real line unit in 06 and it is completely unrecognizable to me today you know what I mean? Looking at the army today at like the tail end of my career and my friends who were still in, I, I, I can't even explain to guys who joined after, especially guys who joined the last 10 years, like what that was. And I think it's gone forever, unfortunately. So I'd like to take a, take a bit of time and talk about um, what you discuss, discussed in uh, Ghost Riders. Um, can you give, uh, I mean, we, we, we've, we've, we've heard you talk about it many times, but can you give, uh, a little snippet about where you were just before deployment and what that, and kind of an overview of, of the time over there? I mean, it's, it just, just to get us kind of started. Yeah. I wrote Ghost Riders right after Afghanistan, and um, and a lot of people, especially a lot of people I had served with in Afghanistan, like in my unit, like some of my old buddies who were like my lieutenants that you know we stayed friends. They were like, "Oh man, why don't you write about the thing that's fresh? You know, like why don't you write about this deployment? Like it was kind of crazy. Like you could write such a great book about it." And I've always kind of planned to go back and do it, but I just haven't had the emotional like bandwidth. But um, but I did Iraq because of the two, the Iraq deployment, not because it was worse necessarily. Um, they're both kind of bad in their own way, but it was the, it, it, I'm skeptical of turning points and pivots and stuff and like singular things that change everything. But the, that collective experience of like the lead up training for the deployment as a platoon leader and then doing those 15 months and getting extended. So it became 15 months. Um, yeah, that was the transformational moment of my life. I mean, that was an extended moment, you know, um, that army was all is also not recognizable to people who are joining now or who have joined the last five or so years since the Afghan surge uh, slowed down, because everyone knew they were going to Iraq. Afghanistan was an afterthought because Afghanistan was pretty safe back then. It was in its brief lull before like the Taliban comes back. Um, it was very clear that you were going. The question was when. The question was what sector you were going to get sent to, and you would like try to war game the whole thing. Um, we were piloting some of the early coin shifts like so, towards counterinsurgency, but we weren't really there yet. And so we were still doing a lot of like mounted gunnery against like, you know, APCs and like BMPs and shit from like the Soviets, you know, but yet we knew that's not what we were going to do. And, but it, it was like a weird time. And um, I was taking this unit into Iraq, this platoon of like 19 guys, small scout platoon, uh, motorized light light unit light infantry unit and um only the sergeants had been to iraq uh three or four out of those 19 and they had done two years earlier right because you, you back then it was a it was an assembly line i mean it was a conveyor belt to yeah. war so you would do a year on in europe a year on in europe right so those guys those sergeants my platoon sergeant who was older he was like 37 and then like 
three of my E6 or E5s had done like the O4 to O5 tour when things first started to go bad. And so they were grizzled as hell. Like even like the ones who were like 23 and like buck sergeants were like badasses in our world. You know what I mean? And they were salty as hell. And they were always like telling like the young guys and even me, you know, as like the Lieutenant, like trying to make sure I knew that like they were the real leaders, you know, like, and like, I get it. Like, I get it. I'm not even like the Mr. Smith. They were always like, we, you guys don't even know what we're about to like roll into kind of thing. You know, like these people are monsters. Like, it's like, you gotta be hard and you gotta be ready to like put a tourniquet on like your, your leg or your emotions, you know, like, um, <laughs> And like, it was just intense. So, and so then we get over there. Um, we're just south of Baghdad. And then we end up moving four, it, four moves, right. Or move three times, four sectors. Um, we really did like the old, you know, it was a cavalry unit, which really just means like l- l- light reconnaissance in this case, we mounted on Humvees and, and a lot of foot patrols, but we did like the old school cavalry, like go to the sound of the guns thing. Like we were just like fiddled around to try to like make this new surge patchwork work. Cause the, the idea then was if you flood, Iraq or any place, especially the city of Baghdad, which was seen as like the epicenter that had to be stabilized first. If you flood it with people and money and, a, and, and, and some candy and soccer balls, hopefully, then like you can like win. And no one really knew what win meant, but we <laughs> made a lot of PowerPoint slides with a lot of buzzwords that like acted like we knew. And so it was intense and, and we were moved around a lot. And so I did get to see, I was kind of like a voyeur. I mean, I got to see like different bits of the war. I fought the Sunnis mostly, the Genesis, the early Genesis of Al-Qaeda Iraq and ISIS down uh, south of Baghdad in like a fairly rural and small city area in, in the suburbs, the Baghdad belt, they called it. And then I did the the Shia East Baghdad Mahdi Army EFBs thing. So I got to see a little bit of all of that. And um, I think the best way to describe the deployment overall was like, it was the most confusing and chaotic mess imaginable. To me, it was beyond imagination, actually. I thought I was going into a really bad war and I knew that we were going into a fairly dangerous sector. And I was surprised by it. Um, I did not think that there could be so much death and cruelty among fellow humans. You know, Um, I got to see that human beings are still in the lizard brain and that we're barely out of the jungle, as George Carlin used to say. Because when that society came apart, and this isn't like an attack on Iraqis, this is like just an, an, a reality on what human beings are and what happens when societies collapse and people get desperate and how like sociopaths and some of like the basest and demagogic elements kind of rise to the fore in moments of crisis. And America's seen some of this recently, right? Um, but it was crazy. And, uh, and then, of course, you're like policing a civil war, but you're really not policing. You're more cleaning up you know, a civil war you caused through your own ill advised and illegal invasion. And that really broke my heart. But also the both sides are attacking you in like equal measure. And so it was just absolute chaos. And I never, ever, ever saw anything very black and white ever again. I mean, everything. I mean, to it, to maybe too much, you know, it, like, it, it made me a weird guy. It made me a guy who's constantly caveating and constantly hedging in the gray and stuff. And I'm, I'm not even sure of myself. I sound way more sure of myself, like in articles and interviews than I, well, maybe in, our, in interviews, I think I'm a little more circumspect, but then I actually am. Like, I just, I, it made me doubt everything. It made me almost like a postmodernist, you know? And even though I don't really subscribe to that in like the scholarly sense, like, because it was so chaotic, yeah. And so, and then of course, and I'll l- let you pivot from there, but like part of being that voyeur to this chaos was that there was a lot of absurd, sometimes funny and often dark, like, anecdotes like things that i just saw that i thought i'd never see you know like you know a a donkey cart goes down a highway pulling like a wagon full of goat heads that then i saw like in soup bowls literally later like i mean just in the midst of like this urban center and this war and there's like smoke billowing because of vbied you know a a car bomb went off like eight blocks over i mean it was just it was insane and i will i'm thankful in some ways for some of the things that I saw, cause I do think that they could be instructive and they uh, taught me a lot about people and society, but, uh, but it was a really, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know if anybody could have like done that. And oh, by the way, I'm not special. And it's, you know, a million of us did, right. A whole generation of us saw that like Oh, four to Oh eight, Oh nine madness in Iraq. But um, it was a uh, man. That shit was life altering. You, well, you know that Henry, right? <laughs> oh Lord. Yes. Um, how did you stomach having to tell your guys about being extended 
about spending three extra months that they didn't have to. Well, I don't know, but I didn't have to, but you know. Yeah. Uh, it was really hard. Uh, I didn't want to be the one to break the news. There were rumors that it was coming. Um, so it's not that everyone was completely surprised so much as that they, uh, you know, it's still hard news to break. Uh, it's like telling someone like, it's like that cop has got to go to the door and like tell, tell their parent that like a, their child died in like a fucking like auto wreck, you know? I mean, yeah. Okay. It's not quite that bad, but is it, is it not? I mean, that means probably someone else isn't coming home that would have. And, and I've said many times that like, it, I'm actually upset with myself that I have not yet done the really, really hard work and never sleepness that will be required to actually determine how many Americans died in surge extensions that would not have otherwise died. How many American soldiers? I think the numbers in probably the low hundreds. Um, that was, it was scary. And it is, it, it really does change things when you think you're going home in October or, or late September of 07. And then like, it's hard to stomach the idea that you're not going home till probably January 1st, you know, of 08. We ended up getting home on New Year's Eve, some 31st, but uh, I didn't want to, you know, you, you know that the messenger gets beat up a little bit and I was worried about a morale sink, um, selfishly to some extent, you know, cause you got to like convince your guys to like get back on that horse and just go out every day. And of course, around the time that's happening is like right as, and right after our big spike of casualties in the platoon, you know? So a total, if you include the later suicides um, or one of the suicides happened while my driver was on leave. So it was during the deployment, but if you include the suicides, uh, four of the guys who were my original 19, we got a lot of replacements, but for the original in the 19, like the original ghost riders, hence the book title is our nickname of the platoon, uh, died, um, in or as a result of that war and then um depending on what you count and don't you know like another you know six or seven are or are, are like legit wounded most of those casualties oddly and you know this like from deployments like it's weird like they're you can be on deployment 15 months but all the bad stuff can happen in one month you know yeah and even though bad things happen throughout almost all of our casualties occur between december 14th 2006 when Ty DeJane, one of my E5s, was shot through the spine and paralyzed to this day uh, south of Baghdad. And, you know, March 1st-ish of 07, when violence starts to slow down a little bit, um, which they said was a result of the surge, but actually was a lot of complicated things. So in other words, we get extended right at the, like, peak of that, like, December, uh, you know, these dates are with me forever. It's like, I literally remember them every year. Like, okay, January 20th, like Eddie Faulkner gets shot through the forearm while taking a piss by a sniper. Uh, January 25th, you know, uh, Alex and Michael, two of the other guys, my son's named after, are basically liquidated in EFP and Ducks gets his fucking body torn apart and loses most of his arm and all that. that in other words, there's like this span where that's happening. It's like right around that time that we're getting extended. So I was really worried about like almost a platoon mutiny as it was. Like, I was just worried that these kids aren't going to buck up and be able to just keep doing this every day in the grind. Cause at that point, our casualties were unsustainable. It turned out things did slow down. But at that point we were facing it. The idea that like, is anyone getting out of here alive or whole, you know, cause at that point, 50% are gone. Like they're dead or they're seriously fucked up in their home. And it's like, wow, that's scared. That's like, I never expected those kind of casualties, even when I knew the Iraq war was going bad. So breaking that news was hard. I just, I, I chain smoked a lot of cigarettes with one of my other Lieutenant buddies, Steve Migliori. He's out now. Um, he's the FSO and um broke the news but i think the thing that lingers with me from that is it really got me thinking about the nature of the all-volunteer force and the nature of military service and i've written a little bit about this because the army bent but did not break during the iraq surge and i almost wish it broke because i wish it would have really exposed how tenuous and how uh fantastical like a veneer smoke and mirrors this all volunteer force that we so highly laud truly is because at that point we have at the height so early 2007 we're talking 100 and what 60,000 at the peak american soldiers in iraq and still about maybe 20 or 30 right thousand in afghanistan which is about to ramp up although we don't know it at the time and that means in, 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 an, in an active duty army, which is bearing most of the burden, you know, the Marines are small and they have their sector, but the army's bearing most of this burden um, in terms of like boots on the ground. We are literally staring at a situation where the army is, 
fifty percent of its force is basically deployed all the time of its is overseas, and then fifty percent is either just like just coming into a refit or ramping up to go. And when you throw in things like Korea and Kuwait and you know and all those things, it really is a one in one ratio. And so the army, when when Bush says Get, we need thirty thousand more for Mister Petraeus to like you know sell his snake oil of the surge, then. It, it really did bend. I mean, they start letting in felons. They start letting in um, GEDs. All, by the way, most of whom perform quite well. They have a slightly higher – stats on that is that they have a slightly higher disciplinary rate. Like they get disciplined, they make mistakes, they get chaptered. But they also have a slightly higher chance of um, getting rewarded for valor. Did you know that? It was true in Vietnam too. Um, the, these, these kids who got the waivers for either lack of high school degree or like prior felony. So – that was interesting, but like, so the, I, it exposed it for me because one of the questions that one of my soldiers asked, and then everyone started piling on, and it wasn't so much an ask as a complaint was like, why us? Like, 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 why are, why are there no other units that can do this? Like, like what, what the heck basically like, and, and, and take into a macro level, if you're a Marine and you do seven month tours, right. By that, or you're a Ranger or, or a special force guy who does like three and six month tours. We're already in early 07. We, I mean, I knew guys who had four or five deployments, you know, and, and, and what it showed to me was that like, the, whether or not the draft is the answer, like not fighting stupid wars is the answer, like almost never fighting wars, but, but whether or not the draft is the answer. And there's something to be said for what that means philosophically, what was clear to me in terms of breaking the news and the way they responded to it, this whole, like, why us thing, like, why do we have to bear all this burden is that, the all volunteer force always was a mercenary endeavor. It always was a contracting out of America's wars away from the populace and onto this small warrior clique. And the way we make up for it is we give them a slightly better pay than what they might get on the outside with the same requisite skills, much better health care, and a whole lot of public applause, right? right? A whole lot of you're better than everybody else, wink, wink. You know what I mean, right? Like you're a real American, you know? And, and that was the, that's what they compensated us with. But the reality is it was always this like Praetorian guard. And I do think that by bending but not breaking in that surge, it reinforced the efficacy and uh, efficiency of an all-volunteer force that didn't really exist. Because we, we forget now, 13 years later, just how close we came to breaking the all-volunteer force. People were yelling about it at the time. There were some generals who were like retired who were like raising some – some serious questions about this, Larry Wilkes and General Leach from EMN were, were among them. But yeah, so that was how I kind of broke it. And it was, it was really shitty and it was demoralizing, but the, you know, I mean, I hate to be like the cliche factory or anything today, but the kids, uh, people get mad when I call my soldiers, the kids, like, it's funny. My soldiers never get mad, but like, you know, a lot of like white, a lot of like white liberals do. They're like, no, give them agency. And I'm like, oh, shut up with the buzzwords. But anyway, the boys like, oh, and that's even worse. So the boys, they they bucked up and they did their job, you know. And and, and it was all for nothing. And I'm sad they did. And, and 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 it's not some amazing thing that they did it, but they did. You know, I broke the news. They hated it. And then they, you know, they did what they always do. They chained smoked cigarettes. They watched a lot of porn. And they took out. They looked out for each other because they're goddamn soldiers. Our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out our honorary producers, and they are Will Lorenz, Fahim Shirazi, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Lapel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Tristan Oliver, Daniel Fleming, Michael Karen, Zach H., Ren Jacob, Howard Reynolds, Why I Am Anti-War, Kenneth Cordasco, 
and the Status Quo podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our awesome store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. The link is in the show notes. And now, let's get back to the podcast. How many of them do you think um, have like come? What if they're like the ones that you you speak to regularly? Like, what have their reactions been, and like how have their views changed over time? That's a good. That's a good question. Um, that occasionally I get asked, but not often enough. Um, you know, the way I describe it a lot of times is like, look, uh, guys like us are fairly unique in the sense that we like are or we're loud right we're like insufferable and self-righteous and like or at least i am you know and we're like we took we're, we're doing something about it and even if it's the smallest of ways right because we should all be clear about like what influence we really have um none of my soldiers really like the guys that and mostly my officer friends eat too but especially i mean most of my joes and sergeants like they're you know they they think i'm crazy a little bit i mean in in the sense that like this like mission or whatever I'm on, uh, or maybe it's like a vanity project. I mean, depending who you ask. Right. But like this whole thing <laughs> is crazy to them, but what has changed and is interesting, it doesn't always have like the sophisticated, like analysis behind it in terms of like lots. And that's not like an insult, but in terms of like lots of reading and, and research and getting down with some like the scholarship on and history of these wars and everything. But th- I don't know any, and I probably stay in close contact, like text call with some regularity, maybe 30 people that I served with, like enlisted guys, not one of them. And I didn't choose them for this reason at all. Some of them were like wildly and still are like a lot of these guys, half of them are Trump supporters, right? Um, mm-hmm. Not one of them believes any longer, to my knowledge, that I can tell that either the wars were ever really winnable, ever particularly worth it. And they would laugh at you, as would the guys who were still on active duty that I served with as officers, some of whom are now lieutenant colonels, would believe that there's like anything to be gained from this, that there's like any victory forthcoming. So, and a lot of them, probably 50%, would go so far as to like describe themselves as anti those wars. You know what I mean? Like maybe not, they wouldn't be like ready to be like, I'm an anti-war activist. Like, no, that's not a comfortable <laughs> label for a, a lot of the guys. But like, a lot, I'd say 50% of them at this point would literally say, and a lot of them have to me like outright, like, yeah, this is all bullshit, you know? And uh, probably the whole thing was, you know? And that was a change. And I've watched guys come around to that. So their journey in that sense has been similar to mine, even if it, you know, was um, maybe a little less like scholastic or like maybe because they're just cooler than me and less geeky, but like they're, they're coming around to the same thing. I would keep an eye on that if I was like a policymaker or if I was a, or even an academic who studies this stuff, because the level of like what I would call veteran combat sort of like nihilism and like fatalism that is like seeped into that community. I'm not sure how the young people coming to the military are now. They may be a little different because they don't like, go to combat with the same regularity or intensity but man that like veteran community like we saw what that means in the swing districts that went for trump you know that had high casualties in the iraq war and stuff um when they you know when they controlled like social scientists tried to do for all those other factors they found out that there was something really seriously um influential about whether a a county in a swing state had like high casualties on a lot of military service and veterans and then the trump winning so you know, I just think you need to keep an eye on this. You created a Praetorian Guard. Uh, you broke a generation of it emotionally. I mean, look at the PTSD stats, the mental health stats, the depression, the suicides. I mean, I feel like those guys, and I'm going on a tangent here, but like the, what you're asking and, and what I think about what those guys is like, we're not the real victims. The real victims are babies that died today in Yemen because they didn't have food. Like, you know what I mean? And, and like those Iraqi teenagers that got excused. So like, please don't misunderstand me listeners. Like I understand that we're not like the woe is me victims. We're not the only ones. And we're certainly probably not the primary or worst ones, but I am, it has been the lot of my life because of a series of decisions that I made 
to be party to and close with and, and, and have a social circle around a core of just struggling, I don't want to say broken necessarily, but struggling veterans who I just, I don't know any who aren't dealing with serious mental health. I know so few who haven't currently past or future again, like substance abuse and stuff. And, um, and they're very fatalistic about it. And they, and they're, and, and they turn insular. A lot of them, like you're with us or you're against us. Like you, like you're part of our tribe or you're not, nobody else gets it. Fuck everybody. Um, and I don't even like mean that as like, they're bad because of it. Like it's an understandable reaction. I've, I've had that sometimes at past phases, but it is a, and they don't believe that what they were doing was like, that valuable and then like but some of them continue to do even today because it's like well it's a paycheck it's like dude we're actual mercenaries at that point like <laughs> washington and those guys were like no we need we, we gotta be careful about standing armies like we we we, we can't have like that we you know we they become detached from society and it's like the bane of the republic once you have like the roman legions like march but you know we we're there we're there yeah. and we're past there and i, I just think that's worth mentioning it's a, it, this is there's something really scary going on and like no one's really talking about it but like the, this 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 veteran cadre of like a lot of people who are just kind of nihilist about it all i'm mean, oh, man I don't, I don't i don't like how that ends and i'm not even sure where it ends right it's it's scary with the implications of just like you you have the apathy or you have the people who go you know a, like our route which is unfortunately there's not as many or you have the other people who go in another direction of doubling down and like, well, I'm going to use my training and stuff to like say, fuck it. And like, fuck this government. And like the people that join the militia groups are like oath keepers or like those kind of things, you know, like that's, that's stuff that we have to pay attention to as a society for sure. Oh yeah. That's usually important. The, the vet to police pipeline and the um, paramilitarization. I mean, it's scary. Of course. When you think about it, I mean, uh, one of the things that's hardest for veterans in my own experience and in the experience of the guys that I know is that, like, you're you're a big deal, even if you're a team leader, right, Henry? I mean, like, you know, if you're a team leader or a squad leader, like, you matter in your little world. Like, you're important to somebody and you have power and more than just, like, the power, because I don't mean to make it a negative, like, you're used to being relied on. You're used to being an important part of a team and, and a cog in that machine that's a leader. And now suddenly you're nothing. Or, or that could be that perception of it. So, like, membership in a paramilitary organization, whether it's an official, you know, state gang, you know, like the, the you know, the other, the other Crips, like the other blue, right, the local police forces in many cases, or the actual just straight up militias, I mean, you can find a home there, you know what I mean? Like an identity and stuff. So yeah. that's scary. That's scary, too. And, and, and I don't think that they're all motivated by, like, evil or something, but it's, it's, an, it's a – keep an eye on that identity word, right? People need to feel an identity and worth and value. And um, there's a generation of veterans that are like free agents, everybody, yeah. unsigned free agents. And it's like, oh, man, who's going to take advantage of that? Extreme groups and PMCs like, you know, Blackwater or Eric Prince's group and, you know, people like that who can promise that same kind of mentality. And like, it's even worse because those guys get paid like four times as much as, you know, the average E4 or E5. So like, I mean, that that to me was the scariest thing coming or when I was seeing that pipeline of like kids that were in uniform and then working at like NSA or Booz Allen or L3 or SAIC, like all the people that just go to these contractors because they, they're making so much more and they can continue that sense of importance and that sense of self-worth. And it's just like, it, it was just so disgusting to me, like, and sad that I thought about it myself, but I, I like had to really wrestle with that. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's gotta be so frustrating. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and we uh, hadn't even mentioned the whole, um, yeah, that whole aspect of Blackwater and like the, the actual mercenaries, you know, um, <laughs> that shit is like really scary, of course. And, um, uh, you got to make a living. You got to pay your rent. If you could pay your rent better than you paid it in the military, but still get some of the same like feeling of brotherhood and all that and purpose, then why not yeah, go to Somalia and up. train? Yeah. And train human rights abusing quote unquote elite 
infantry light infantry units you know on behalf of africom or you know whatever go on raids or, or try to start a coup in venezuela like why not do that and um like i said it's a lot of unsigned and vaguely competent uh undrafted you know free agents then and, and keep an eye on folks what was your favorite item to get in a care package uh well obviously books um because geek squad was strong here um and and actually handwritten letters were really cool um sometimes they came from uh family members or whatever especially like my grandparents who were still alive at the time because like they weren't gonna send an email you know and that was cool um and then uh, well i mean and then on the mundane side like beef jerky, like any beef jerky, hot sauces, like stuff like that. It's just stuff to nibble on in the Humvee while I convince myself I'm brave, you know, uh, and, and I'm not actually, but, uh, you know, I said I lived on that stuff and, uh, and that was it. So it's, it's a couple answers, but like each of them, as you know, like different, like there's like the emotional thing that you really like getting a VR package. And then there's like the, uh, you know, the practical snacks and stuff. Uh, aside from reading on deployment, um, what other pastimes did you have? Were there any uh, video games you like to play? You know, uh, I, I never really played video games much, um, like my whole life. I just never really was like a gamer, and um, of course, like all my, my friends are, and uh, and I my, and my son makes me play just so he can make fun of me in front of his friends because like he likes to tease how bad I am, especially war games. Like he'll make me play like Call of Duty or whatever those games are with them. And then, like, I lose terribly to these, like, 12-year-olds. And then he loves, like, to, like, because he, like, shows off and, like, makes fun of his dad. And he'll be like, Dad, weren't you, like, in the war? Like, how are you so bad at this, you know? Um, and, of course, like, <laughs> then I tell them all about why I didn't play video games much growing up, you know? And uh, because I, I like to be petulant and, like, provocative. And I'll be like, I'll be like, guys, you're growing up in a different world. Like, you know, like, the gamers are cool now. I was like, but in my little like weird sub world of like toxicity and like 90 Staten Island, like my answer when people would ask me, do you play video games? You know, as an adult, I'd be like, nah, man, I kiss girls. You know what I mean? Like it was just, it was just a different world. So I didn't really do that. Um, but what I did do as a pastime, and oh, by the way, I'm like, I don't really think people play video games, but all my best friends do, but I just never really got into it. But what I did do uh, is I played like Axis and Allies, like board game. Mm -hmm. So like equally like, oh, by the way, like those dudes were just slaying right uh, on the, on the, on the dating market. Like, so who am I to even joke? That was a hyper geek, but yeah, I would play like access now. It's like world War II strategy game a little bit. Um, I would like teach sometimes I would like teach other uh, lieutenants or whatever or soldiers to play. And then there was always a few who did who already did. Um, and what else uh, did I do? You know, I didn't do much else besides reading. Oh, and I, I binge watch shows. So this might interest people like in terms of like this, the mundane, like fun stuff from that time I got in the two shows that I got into and binge watched up as many as seasons as they had. And then continued watching some after were uh, the office and, uh, and the wire, right. Which are two very different, but equally sort of like critically lauded at the time shows. Um, and the wire interested me because it's about like police and drug dealers and stuff in Baltimore uh, and the bureaucratic problems in both. But the wire was like watching it was like looking in the mirror i mean there were so many parallels to what we were doing like some of the absurdity of it and like the drug war and then the war on terror and the leadership in the military and the careerism and stuff but um and then the office on a lighter note um i like to joke that the only way i could fall asleep in iraq was to the theme song of the office and how like that theme song and like the setting of like random Scranton, which of course, like now we have the president like from Scranton sort of in his youth in charge who always brings it up, show how tough he is. But like the like the setting of Scranton, the theme song of the office, and the like unrequited early seasons romance between Jim and Pam at that moment in time, we're talking 2006 or seven, represented everything good about America to me. Like that was like what I wanted to go home to, you know? And so, uh, yes, yeah, so that was my other hobby. Yeah. Well, did you did you find out about Iraq? Like, w like when did you figure out it was a lie? And like, was that before your first deployment or after? I had um, I I might not have described it as a lie when I got there, um, but I had read Fiasco uh, by Tom Ricks, which you know really did do a 
you know, I don't like everything Tom Brooks does now, but, uh, but it was a pretty decent, like journalistic account of like the, the madness and like obfuscation and you know misdirection and, and, and any, and even just outright lies that led to the invasion and then like the failures of the early generalship. Um, I read that and then I had read even more profoundly the new American militarism uh, by Andrew Basevich. Um, and that really shook me because he wasn't a journalist. He right. wasn't part of the liberal media elites, you know, uh-huh. he was a West Point grad. And by the way, at that time, so am I. And is there anything more wonderful than a West Point grad? You know? So it was like, <laughs> so like the credibility was like unbelievable. You know what I mean? And then he'd been in Vietnam, which was like a real war, you know, at least right. as bad as Iraq. Um, and so when he was taking down not only the Iraq war, but like our military adulation culture and like national service or lack thereof culture, and then also just like the systemic and imperial element of our militarism, I was shaken by that. So I went into Iraq a skeptic of the war. I definitely thought like mistakes were made and I would have used that passive voice too, probably at the time, you know, (laughs) I was like, I was ready to run a government agency and topple another country. He's government, you know, like I I had that level of passive voice inflection in my thinking. Um, That was some nice PAO shit right there. Right. Keep an eye on that, by the way, if, if, if motherfuckers be using the passive voice in government, like if you're in Latin America, Africa or Eastern Europe, watch out there's a coup coming you know but um you know what i mean like like hey hey that that uh import export uh expert that's in your port city like he definitely works with cia and like watch out because he's going to train a militia to kill you in the palace but anyway uh but you know so that's where i was at but it was when i was in iraq that i that i would have early on too like within a few months that i would have described the whole thing as a lie because what i did then was i didn't like what i was seeing it didn't match what we had been told and so then i did what I do when I get frustrated is I went manic and, and I read all those over a hundred books and um, they included a a lot of books that went deeper than, than what Rick's had done on the, the lead up to the Iraq war. And then also went broader in terms of the, the longer arc of American relations with not only Iraq, but the middle East. And so by the new year or by February or March of 07, I got there in October of 06. Um, yeah, the whole thing. I, I, I could not believe what my governor had done three and a half years ago. And I was wildly uh, disappointed with myself for not having been uh, aware of it or interested in even finding out earlier. I wanted to uh, <clears throat> shift over a little bit and talk about some uh, leadership stuff now. I have a, uh, a quote here from uh, from Ghost Riders. It wasn't even the rank or pay. Rather, it was about life's prospects. Most of the LTs I served with saw the army as a very temporary thing. They'd sit around and talk loudly, sometimes in front of their soldiers, about things like investments, stocks, and what kind of jobs they planned to get when they once they left the service. Corporate headhunters did indeed seek out young former military officers, mm-hmm especially West Pointers, for good-paying middle management positions. We all knew that a solid career awaited us on the outside. All we had to do was take it. Not so for most of the young troopers. A scarce few completed any college. Some only had a GED. And for many, the Army wasn't just some uh, fleeting expedient, but rather a chance to make something of themselves. How must those officers have sounded to the young troopers within earshot? like a bunch of smug, entitled pricks. That's how. The gap between us would always be there. Perhaps it always was. Our paths were just too distinct. That, uh, you know, I wrote that about guys that I drank and loved and some of whom I'm still close with, you know? And so uh, as I wrote that, I remember writing it in my uh, bedroom, my townhouse during grad school. Um, That was one of those things you write where you're like, somebody's going to read this and know I'm talking about them, you know, uh, (laughs) you know, and, and and I'm, I'm still glad that I did. And, uh, and I understand where they were coming from. And, you know, I was probably virtue signaling a little bit because the, the subtext of what I wrote there is that not me, I'm a working class hero. You know, my background is so different from the other officers. I got my troops, you know what I mean? Like, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to see, some of my thought there, but what remains true about it is that, well, what I'm describing happened often. Uh, the viewpoint 
of the guys I graduated with and served with among the officers was very much like West Point is a stepping stone. West Point and the Army and this combat deployment is like a stepping stone to like some other career. Um, and they can be forgiven for that. I mean, I, I, I get it. Like, I don't think everyone should be a lifer. Um, but it bothered me at the time. And I knew it must have bothered the soldiers to a certain extent. And what it really demonstrated is what's always been true, even though we lie about it and are like, you know, I mean, look, the, the subtext of Tom Clancy novels is that the army is a classless and race blind society in microcosm, which represents the best of what America could be if it only had the balls to do it. And it's totally meritocratic. That's the myth. It's like, that's the Clancy eighties myth of what the military is. And there's some truth in it. Right. You know, in the 1980s, the United States army was, and the Marine Corps was like, well, the whole military was like the only major institution, corporate, like private or public in uh, the united states where like black guys regularly bossed white guys around with some you know i mean not to the extent they should have in terms of how many of them were senior officers but like it was a thing right so there's some truth in it but there's a lot of not there's and what i'm saying is the military has always been a class society the navy's at least honest about it because they make their officers wear those white shoes you know um <laughs> but like i mean in the navy they still like serve them and stuff or at least they did oh, yeah. you know i mean it's a the navy like does not lie about their class like the army tries to hide it more um, and the Marines, but you know, there's always been class in the military and, um, and the officers enlisted really were worlds apart their experience, their prospects, like they might die together, you know, captains and lieutenants die and lieutenants die a lot. Um, but, and they might fight together and they might suffer together, but in the end, if they live, right. And if they don't lose their legs, their lives are often very different and, and, and therefore their, their expectations are different. And, and some of their, I don't know. It, it, it did bother me a lot. And I think it, it's illustrative of a lot of the aspects of the military microcosm society and why we need to be careful about lauding it the way that like Tom Clancy did and like the Reagan people did. And people still do as this like, look, we it, the again, to use the word subtext again, the, the subtext again of a lot of the adulation of the military as like an institution and a culture, the the vague implication is it's better than society. It's better than the civilian society. Like you are better by being part of it and its values are better. It almost like, it's almost to make America great again, except in microcosm, in the myth. Like, in other words, it's like, even if you go to a military base, like there is a vague sense of like the wonder years, you know, everybody lives in like the same neighborhoods and walk to school together. And there's a lot more stay at home moms sometimes. And, you know, but what, what, what's happening under the service is something that was happening in real life in the 1950s. So it's, like, it's like way more revolutionary road than it is like the wonder years in the sense that, you know, or, or leave it to beaver in, in, in the sense that there's a uh, massive addiction and domestic abuse and PTSD and trauma and depression and like all these problems under the service. And there was always this class element. And like, so that was what I sort of got out of that. I think we have to be very careful about putting anything on a pedestal and saying it's the example, because once you do that, people start acting like it is, and then they'll start applying the lessons. But like, what if you're answering the wrong questions and applying inappropriate things? And so I'm very skeptical of this idea of like military adulation as a society. It has a lot of the same problems that our society has you know, in micro, in macro form. And then, um, and then it also has some of its own that are, you know, really toxic. What do you feel like your strongest leadership qualities were? Or are? Um, you know, I, uh, I've i gone back and forth. I, I'm, like, very skeptical of my own leadership sometimes. You know, uh, I think people should be. Um, it's easy to be the hero of your own story. Well, what was your strengths and your weaknesses? Well, yeah, about- okay, so, like, I think my strengths were that I actually do – I do and I did care about people, Um, local civilians, local people, and and my soldiers especially. So I generally – I cannot think of any – of many situations where I, like, made a move with my guys um, that might, like, put them in any harm for any sort of ambition or expediency with the bosses, you know. Um, I tried really hard to protect them and I was a hard worker. So my way of leading from the front, like sometimes I was brave enough, but like, I wasn't like some like 
fucking ball of courage officer or something like that, like leading from the front with like his arm, literally follow me. Like, you know, I had my <laughs> moments, but I had plenty of moments where I hid behind a Humvee. You know what I mean? And I was like, I got to call on the radio because my legs won't work. You know, like, like frozen fear. So I, mean, I did both. I, I wasn't, I mean, sometimes I was good and sometimes I wasn't good when it came to the physical courage, but my way of like sort of leading front or leading and well was that I was, I was, decently competent because i worked really hard so like i would plan the shit out of missions and i really would try to do my diligence so i don't know i brought like an energy and a reasonable amount of confidence uh competence to the job um and i think i connected with i mean i'm still friends with all like enormous numbers of them i mean i don't know that it makes me a good leader that this is true but i i don't think you'd find a soldier of mine or more than a handful out of the hundreds that at some point were under my command who would say i didn't have like empathy for, you know like so that was probably if i had to pick one word i'd say probably empathy and I, I hate how it sounds coming out of my mouth so like self-aggrandizing but it's true about me the weaknesses were more um i would take that too far and so sometimes my only goal was protect 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 us you know um to the point of like lying frankly uh, to bosses and stuff now one person could look at that and i used to think that made me a hero by the way uh i one could look at that and say like that's the right thing to do in an absurd war and i do still think there's some truth in that however yeah. it, where does that end you know what i mean <laughs> like i know like I, I so i'm a little more skeptical of that and um and then i would say probably the other weaknesses were so and i would get too close to my guys and so that would sometimes uh make it really hard on me like sort of personally uh in terms of my own mental health when when because like we get really close to your guys and then they start dying you know it's like that was hard and i think that sometimes i was an enabler of some of my soldiers because i would um i would protect them and apologize for them and do anything even when they were acting toxically like in their home lives and stuff like that like i guess i would kind of like um I was an enabler. I'm an enabler in my general life. Anyone who knows my relationship with some of my family members, and stuff, like I've been an enabler. Uh, I think I'm being a hero, but maybe maybe I'm not helping. So there was that. Um, and then there were also probably times in combat where I should have um, I should have performed better in a physical courage way. You know, where um, where I where I, I just I just got frozen a little. You know, and um, and I and I probably made a few hasty calls or or not calls, right? that may have may have ended up getting people hurt you know it's hard to say um but but very likely did because it's just it just made i made some bad calls either through lack of a fast enough decision or 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 a hasty and um and and an opportune one and and so i live with that and uh you know I, I was i was hardly some sort of hero but i think that would probably explain it best i was just trying to think of like what you would be like if you were my superior officer and i think i would have enjoyed you a lot <laughs> Oh, you know what would surprise you though is that uh, this this surprised people, especially now. Um, one of the things was that um, I actually, when I was a captain, uh, I was known as like a, a bit of a hard ass at first. That surprised <laughs> everyone um, about certain things. So, like my lieutenants, who I'm still really close with, I'm going to one of their weddings in May uh, out in Cali. Uh, when they heard I was coming to take over B Troop from the staff from the ops uh, ops office, you know, operations. Uh, department i um they were like oh shit like you know because i was really big on like pt and like um like i expected like my i was harder on officers than enlisted guys like subordinate officers i was really hard on like my op orders like i was like hard on the confidence and i would like make them work long hours and stuff like that um but so in that sense that does surprise people but uh but at the same time very quickly i think they realized that i was like a goofball and i want and i love them and i get close to them and i probably get too close to them and we party together and stuff so but but yeah that surprised people they, people are always surprised to hear that that i was like kind of known as a little bit hard ass my, my soldiers would my like lieutenants would tell you that they like think it's very funny because now we're such friends like we're like besties they're like remember when you were like we thought you were a, a badass like now <laughs> now we realize you weren't at all but like we thought you were so hard you know So uh, I think this would be the last uh, last question for today. Um, I wanted to ask you about how how you see your path to descent, um, say from af after you wrote Ghost Riders to now. Um, you had a, a a brief discussion with the guys on Eyes Left about the idea that that military service, military trauma. Uh, shouldn't be 
required for anybody to um, demonstrate the validity of their argument about U.S. imperialism, about us being in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I wonder, uh, kind of going from, like I said, where, where you were when you published Ghost Riders, that what's the arc of your descent in that time? What, you know, where did, when you look at that Danny versus today's Danny, what do you see in terms of differences? Yeah, that is a good, that's a good place to end. I think that's a good one. Um, I'm still in that arc, you know, I was, I'm still on the treadmill. I mean, I'm still, I mean, I think I'd give you a different answer in two years probably. Um, Cause I'm still kind of growing. You know what I mean? Uh, in the beginning, I was floundering a little. Uh, I was in distress. I had had like close to nervous breakdown collapse. Like I had white knuckled it. And then I was really hit with like depression, anxiety or co-occurring elements of PTSD stuff that I had like kind of ignored while I was, especially in like command positions, you know, where it's just like, just get the job done, worry about it later. Like, you know, pay for the therapist later. Um, but so part of it was a, it was like a cry for like a help in a way, or it was just like an emo. It was like it was like a, a bit of a. There's a lot of stream of consciousness in there. I think I, there are parts of that book that I think I wrote well, but there are parts where I'm like, oh man, like you are not okay <laughs> when you read that, but when you wrote that. But so I think initially there was one element of it that was like, is this really dissent or is this like, uh, like a a cry for help slash a frustrated and fairly angry uh treatise you know like an angry essay um it was a lot of things but what 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 definitely happened though is that it changed my life because it started that road to writing you know i mean i mean i i published that book you know with you know dartmouth you know with university of new england press so like a real press you know i didn't like self-publish not that that's like bad or it can't be a good book but i hadn't i hadn't i hadn't published an article yet you know it's like backwards you know what i mean like i hadn't done any writing i just wrote this book and so but the thing is, it like whetted my appetite. I realized I liked it. I really, and then I think I got a little confident that maybe I could do it. So then I, that kind of led me into like the articles, and the, and that really kind of threw me on the path of something close to more active descent. And that's what finally got the army like aware of like you know, Ghost Riders never got on the army's radar really, with with the exception of like one time when like a colonel in like the military professionalism and ethic program at West Point, like called me in his office to yell at me because he hated ghost riders and thought I was like writing the worst possible lessons to teach the lieutenants in it. Like besides that, which was just like an internal squabble, uh, there was never any like fallout from ghost riders, um, but it started me on the path where it would be. So, but what changed in my view of descent and my own role in it was more that um, in the beginning, I think, I thought that my having been there was enormously important and that like veteran voices needed to speak out and like we do, we have our platform matters maybe more than anybody else's. And then I also think that initially I didn't see myself at that time as somebody who was going to like get out um, and like be active at all on the outside to the extent that I have been like in terms of activist circles. It was more like I saw myself as like one of these like inside the military, like intellectuals, like, causing a little bit of waves, you know, a little bit of a maverick, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> to a certain extent, I think I saw myself there a little bit. Uh, but over the process after that, I really came to believe that, you know, this idea of changing the system from within was flawed and that the, the, the disease is too deep and it's and it transcends the military, right? It's a societal and political disease. And so I got more systemically critical. And then I started to question whether it is healthy for a society to put its soldiers and veterans on such a pedestal and give them such added weight with the, again, subtext of if you're not that, you matter less and you have less, less weight and credibility. I started to wonder if, if that gets recreated in, um, in the outside circles, even in the left circles, even in the anti-war circles, then are we not, yeah, the cause might be better, but are we not recreating some of the same like flawed societal cultural traditions of militarism? And so then I started to think, wait a second here, like we got to be careful about overplaying this veteran card. And then I think finally soldiers and veterans see war through 30, an airplane at 30,000 feet through a straw, you know, and 
And I probably am better than most, but not perfectly like to read the big stuff and like get the context and big picture. But like just lending weight to a military officer or a military veteran because he was that, uh, that doesn't like there's a lot of civilian academics and civilian activists, for example, who got this way before we did and see it in its broader picture and context. And so I think that they need to have like a really preeminent role. And if it's militarism, I'm fighting. If it's imperialism, if it's if it's if it's physical and cultural militarism, that is the enemy, as I believe it is, then then I don't know that it's healthy for militarists, even if reformed, right, or military people to be the vanguard for that. All that being said, Yes, I'm a realist because I get a lot of follow-ons. You guys want to ask them, but I get a lot of follow-ons from folks like, yeah, but don't you think it is? Yes, I live in the world as it is. I know that in the current moment, it's easier to get, still hard, but it's easier to get like published or your voice out there if you have this like veteran platform and credentials that does lend some weight. The Smedley Butler syndrome is real. And um, and I live in the world as it is and we should use it. And I do think that veterans have a, I'll say they have a responsibility. I think, I think we have a responsibility to to uh, teach to others what we know and I, I you know i end a million uh interviews with like the charlie sheen quote in the the soliloquy in the helicopter so these vietnam you know it's like um you know we didn't fight ourselves we fought each other and i think now looking back you know the, the the war is over for me but it'll always be there but what he says that's really important he says you know um uh be that as it may those of us who did make it have an obligation, you know, have an obligation to build again, to teach to others what we know and to try with what's left of our lives to find the goodness and the meaning in this life. Now, I don't think any of that and what we know makes us better, but I think that we did a lot of bad things overseas. We were part of a lot of bad institutions. Doesn't make us all bad guys, but I, um, yeah, I still think despite all of my caveats that we have an obligation to kind of, you know, try with what's left of our lives to, you know, build a better world and, and call out some of the obscenity we've seen. And so that's, uh, that's kind of how my arc developed. Like most things in my life, it went from very specific and a little bit navel gazing and a little bit self-righteous to, a, and I'm still there. We're all flawed, but, but to a little bit more systemic, broad and self-critical of both me and the institutions I was part of, including veteran communities, including veteran activist communities. Right. I love that you said that. Cause it's just like, yeah, the idea is we have this platform, but like ideally we don't want it. Like we want everybody's voice who is standing up for this to matter equally because that's the point is that human lives matter and everything else is just secondary. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, sometimes to like really believe in something or critique something that's big and bold like it you almost have to start with like throwing away all your medals you know yeah, and, and just i don't mean that yeah yeah de- right like scholars know this like this whole idea of like constructivism and stuff like you gotta i mean they took it too far but there's a lot of like truth in it and um i think that if you're going to really make a big change in your life you can't do that tenuously you gotta change everything <laughs> you gotta look um, and almost none of us do. I'm sure I haven't fully either. But, uh, you know, you got to take a hard look and be willing to, like, give away the stuff that benefits you to some extent. And a lot of people listen and be like, yeah, don't you have a medical pension? And all that? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I get it. But, like, I'm a, I'm a hypocrite. You know, I'm Doc Holliday, right? I'm Doc Holliday when he, like, puts the badge on to fight Johnny Ringo. And, uh, you know, after he kills Johnny Ringo, like, Wyatt Earp comes over to him and looks at him and sees the badge and uh, that he's put it on Ringo's body. And he goes, uh, you know. Uh, see, he had said earlier in the movie, he says, it appears my hypocrisy knows no bounds, <laughs> you know, but like, so that's still true. But at the same time, I do think you have to like, if we're, if we're fighting against militarism, that has to include giving away the gold stars that society is giving us to a certain extent. Doesn't mean that military service has no honor. Doesn't mean that we're all bad people, but like, we have to say, maybe it's not about us. Maybe it's about something bigger. And maybe our, our status is only what it is as a symptom of the broader problem we're fighting. So how can we recreate that? Well, no, we can't, we have to, we have to reject it. Right. We have to change it and end the hyper individualism within ourselves. If we want to end it in society. hundred percent. 
or on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention I will not